Welcome. I'm Jack Welch, and I'm here today with David and Joanne Seeley, and we're going to be talking about Lehi's Jerusalem. What would it have been like to travel to Jerusalem 600 years before the birth of Christ? And what was that world like that Nephi grew up in? And how do we know about these things? David and Joanne, welcome. I'm glad to have you here with us. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And uh, David and Joanne have been on the BYU faculty and have been teaching for over 30 years at the BYU Jerusalem Center. What's it been like to teach over there all those years? Well, it's a great experience because you get to go there with students that are full of life and love for the scriptures, and you get to introduce them to the places and the people of old that we love so much. Does it help them understand the scriptures to know a little bit about the geography and the history there? Well, of course, and that's the reason they go. There is nothing better than having a day of study on a field trip bus, visiting the places and reading the scriptures on site. And do you talk just about the Bible or also about the Book of Mormon at the Jerusalem Center? Well, we have formal courses in Old Testament and New Testament, and we have a formal course on the history and culture of the ancient Near East as a background to the scriptures. But then the Book of Mormon is always lurking because students are reading it on their own time. Sometimes we go with the Come Follow Me year of Book of Mormon. And it's, it's a fabulous foundation for their Book of Mormon studies. Just this year, while we were there, uh, Elder Holland stopped by for a short visit and he gathered all the students in the auditorium and he was talking to them about the purpose of the Jerusalem Center and about their studies there. And he mentioned, you study the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have classes in this, you study in the classroom, you go on field trips to the sites. And then he said, but I want you to remember the Book of Mormon begins in Jerusalem. And this is a perfect foundation for the studies of the Book of Mormon for the rest of your life. Isn't that a wonderful way to emphasize the realities here that, uh, I mean, Lehi had some contemporaries. And David, you, you've done a lot with uh, the contemporaries of Lehi. Who else lived during Lehi's time that well, might be known to people because of the Old Testament? Most importantly, because he's so well documented is the prophet Jeremiah. And we know a lot about him from his own work, even by autobiographical kinds of things about him. But we know who his um, contemporaries were. We knew a lot about Zedekiah. We know a lot about the country that he lived in. The archaeology is pretty good uh, in Jerusalem from 600 BC. Do you, do you think Lehi and Jeremiah knew each other quite well or just casually? Well, almost certainly since the Book of Mormon refers to the fact that Jeremiah's writings are on the brass plates. So certainly they knew of each other, and I'm, I'm sure they probably knew each other. And how did Jeremiah's writings get on the brass plates if Jeremiah is still prophesying even after the Jer Jerusalem's destruction? Well, it's a great observation because it tells us somebody in Jerusalem is collecting the words of the prophets as they're being pronounced. And of course, the keeper of the plates is Laban. There's a great story there about what's going on in terms of keeping the plates that we don't know about, actually. There's a real active scribal tradition right at 600, and we know that from even other sources than the brass plates. So would you say that the more you know about Jeremiah, the more you'll know about Lehi? Certainly. They were both prophets who were talking to people who rejected their message and shared the sorrows the joy for Lehi was he got to leave, and Jeremiah was stuck there <laughs> with Jerusalem and the Judahites to see the fall of Jerusalem. Of course, Lehi got into the desert and had his own challenges with Laban and Lemuel. So. We have a chapter in Glimpses that talks about this, and it's really interesting the two types of these two prophets. Lehi, who is a type of the Exodus, he's going to leave Jerusalem and go through the wilderness and eventually end up in the Promised Land. They'll have the law there whereas Jeremiah is sort of the anti-Exodus prototype. He is going to be banished to the wilderness and preside you know, in exile over the people. And so there are very interesting contrast between these two prophets as, as types in this way. And I sometimes think about these prophets that were there at 600 BC. You know, maybe they had a really great elders quorum where they knew each other, I don't know. 
It's just well, an interesting did. thought. They did have what they called the School of the Prophets. Yes. And so they're meeting in some way and uh, probably sharing with each other successes and failures and probably, uh, you know, when Uriah was, was taken out and killed, I imagine Lehi and Jeremiah probably weren't too close to that event, but certainly were well aware of it and realized that it could just as well happen to them. Well, Joanne, you mentioned glimpses. Now that's short for a, the name of a book. What's yes. the name of the, the whole name of the book so people can find well, this Well, let book? me just pick it up right here. This book, Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem. This is a book that gathers the information that we've been talking about all together in one volume. And I think it's a great source for studying the Book of Mormon. In fact, is there any other book, David, that actually focuses on this decade, uh, the decade before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and what's going on in Jerusalem and in the region around Jerusalem? Well, there's lots of books about Jerusalem, obviously, lots and lots of these. And, but in those books, usually this is just a chapter. It's a pivotal chapter because this is where the end of the Judites happens and the beginning of the exile, but it's just a chapter. And in terms of the background for the Book of Mormon, this focuses on that very period and gives us everything we need to know to intelligently read the historical, cultural, archaeological, even agricultural context of the Book of Mormon. This book is sensational. It really is. And uh, is it available today? Now, the answer to that question is this book is out of print and has been for quite a while. It went through a hardback edition and a paperback edition. Uh, and maybe it should be updated and reprinted at some point. But for right now, uh, anyone can find this book for free on the Scripture Central or Book of Mormon Central archive. And if you go there and follow carefully the, uh, the steps that you need to put in, just search for glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem. Uh, you can find, first of all, a PDF version of all of these pages. And in addition, if you click on each individual chapter, you can uh, have an HTML text version which allows you to cut and paste and work within that. So it's available and maybe more widely available today than even a book version because, well, book versions don't go over the internet like that. Right, and you can read it on your phone. Yeah, yeah. so it's great, so it's you there. You can even read it in Jerusalem if you want. And I would say for you know, the first three months of uh, the Come Follow Me study this year, uh, bookmarking that and having that book ready to go would be uh, uh, a wonderful study idea. But David, tell us a little bit about uh, what was the motivation? How did this book get started? What's the background of it? Well, for me, everything about the Book of Mormon begins with Hugh Nibley. And Hugh Nibley was talking about the Book of Mormon in the 40s and the 50s, and he was writing books like Lehi in the Desert. Uh, he wrote a book called approach to the Book of Mormon, and he wrote that book in 1957, and over half of that book is about the context of the Book of Mormon in Jerusalem. And Brother Nibley was trying to show, and he was defending to critics of the Book of Mormon, that the Book of Mormon fits nicely into the historical and cultural context that is well documented from biblical studies. And this book actually uh, approaches to the Book of Mormon became the course of study for the Melchizedek Priesthood, and 1964 and with a heading uh, introduction by uh, Joseph Fielding Smith and it contained lots and lots of scholarly footnotes. We would love to have gone back and seen the elder, the Melchizedek Priesthood Quorums approaching that volume. Well, I can tell you one story about it where uh, uh, when uh, the question came up whether Brother Nibley's book should be used as a church-wide Melchizedek Priesthood handbook, uh, it was in a, uh, a committee meeting, and David O. McKay, the president of the church, was on that committee. That's the Melchizedek Priesthood Committee. And one of the people said, I think this will be over the heads of a lot of the brethren, and they're going to have to reach a bit to understand this. And President McKay said, 
let them reach. And that's how that became the Melchizedek Priesthood Handbook. And David, it's interesting you mentioned 1964. It was in that year, 1964, that I had Hugh Nibley as my Book of Mormon teacher in an honors class at BYU. And I had read the uh, Lehi in the Desert and uh, an approach to the Book of Mormon before coming to that class. So I had a, a little step up on it, but it was like drinking from a fire hose to have Brother Nibley as the teacher. And he would be muttering and lecturing to himself as he walked into the classroom and didn't even know how many people were in the room, just kept talking. And he would talk the whole time. And when he was finished, he'd, the bell would go off and he would start walking out, shuffling his cards. And what an experience to sit and learn from him. It was great. But Brother Nibley, he set out the program, really. He introduced all the historical context, the archaeology, the new text that had been discovered. I remember his article on the Lachish letters that are, com that are completely from the, the time period of Jeremiah and Lehi. And so he laid this out. And in 2004, when this book was published, we had, several years earlier, decided that this material needed to be consolidated. It needed to be updated. And it needed to be made in a form that would be more approachable to the members of the church. And therefore, uh, this book uh, is really reader friendly that way. It gives us the cultural background. Uh, you can talk a little bit about the culture gram that's in this book. You're absolutely right, David. This book is reader friendly. And we thought about all of the readers, including women. Joanne, there's a chapter in this book on uh, women in Jerusalem. Yes, what Ari do you think about Ariel Bybee did that. I think it's fantastic because this is one of the stories in the scripture that talks about the whole family. There aren't that many that do that, but we have Sariah, we have the sons, Nephi and Laman and Lemuel and Sam, and we have their wives that come to play in this story. And during this story, it's not just a collection of prophecies. There's lots of prophecy, but it's a dramatic story of their life, what happened to them in Jerusalem, their travels in the wilderness, their interactions with each other, great challenges they faced. And so you start thinking about what each member of that family was going through, what Sariah faced leaving her home. It was probably a well-established, nice home and living in the wilderness all those years. How did she prepare the food? You know, what was her life like? And um, that chapter takes a little look at that, which is very interesting. And when you say they lived in a nice house, do we have archeological indications of what Lehi's house might have looked like? Well, there is a, there's a chapter by Jeff Chadwick, and he talks both about where Lehi might have lived and what his home would have been like in Jerusalem as well as where the land of inheritance, where they went back to get their, their money or their, you know, their riches to get the plates. And when he discusses this, he talks all about how Jerusalem has expanded. By the time of Lehi, there's been a lot of migration of the northern tribes into the area of Jerusalem onto the West Hill, and likely that's where Lehi and his family lived. And he talks about what a typical Israelite home was like. You know, they had a courtyard with basically four rooms around it. There were places for their animals to stay, a place to cook. If you had enough money, you had an upstairs for sleeping quarters. And there's wonderful diagrams and charts in that chapter talking just what their life might have been like. I, I often think of Lehi and his family living up on that hill in either the Maktesh or Mishneh expansions of Jerusalem and knowing there's only one place you can go to get water, the water source, that walk for Sariah or for the children was a good walk way down the hill with a heavy ceramic pot to fill up with water and carry all the way back up to their home. So lots of these little insights come out and you can think about as you read about what life was like then. And we have a good idea of what these houses are. I mean, Jeff Chadwick isn't just making this up, right? Oh, no, he Isn't has it? diagrams and we actually have some photographs of a home from 600 BC that's in, been excavated in the ruins there, right in the area of Jerusalem. So we can get, you can get a real concept of what it was like. 
Yeah, and when you think of them leaving, packing up, in the middle of the night, Lehi gets the word of the Lord that he needs to leave, and his life probably was at risk uh, because he's telling people Jerusalem will be destroyed, and this is not a popular message. And other prophets had been killed for saying exactly that same thing. So he packs up with his camels and everything, and apparently he had camels and he could travel. He knew how to live in the wilderness and how to travel. Do you think that was unusual for people in those days? Or would many people have known how to uh, travel? Well, Nibley made the argument that the contextual evidence suggests that maybe he was a merchant, that he did have some experience because they know how to do this. But even though they know how to do it, that doesn't discount the fact that it's a huge sacrifice to be out there. And when we read about the kinds of hardness of heart that's being developed and the murmuring in the wilderness, we can better appreciate exactly what that meant for the people leaving their homes. And maybe the murmuring was even greater because they knew what it was like out there. That's right, <laughs> that they knew what it could be like. And they were leaving actually forever, not just temporarily, right? They come to discover that they're not going back. You know, even when we're on an air-conditioned bus with 50 students out in the wilderness areas, you can get a little murmuring because it, it can get rough and it's hot when you're off the bus and there's not a lot of water. They had to really work hard at making that journey. Well, David and Joanne, this book sounds pretty exciting today. I'll bet it was even more exciting 20 years ago when it first came out. And in fact, look what I found in my copy of the book. This is a full page from the church news on the publication of this book. And Lehi's Jerusalem gives scriptural insight, looks at politics, everyday life, agriculture, and many other things. And the, uh, the little invitation here is, let's go to Lehi's Jerusalem. The journey will be arduous but fascinating. So that was kind of unusual to have a full page in the church news on the release of a book. Uh, what do you remember about 20 years ago and the release of this book? How did you feel when it came out? Well, one of the fun things about this book was is that we were able to chart out exactly the kinds of things we wanted in the book. But we went about to, to involve as many people as we could with their own ex areas of expertise to participate in the book. And many of the people that participated in this book, for example, hadn't been participating very much in Book of Mormon studies. So we offered the invitation to them. And we ended up with a collection of lots of really quality pieces from lots of different people. Uh, we were able to get the archeologists. We have a chapter on the agriculture by people that study agriculture. Who was that? Let's mention some of these. As you just look down the table of contents, I, I actually want to start with the very first thing. Just we, You mentioned the culture gram, but I wanted to point out one of the wonderful things about this culture gram. It talks all about what life might have been like, but I loved the illustrations that were added in there by Michael Lyon. They're like little windows into what it was like to be there, and you can start to imagine what it felt like. So I thought that was a wonderful way to start this, and then moving from that into the list of people that were alive that we know about, and then, you know, Jeff Chadwick and talking about the home, which, which we've already mentioned. It just was a nice way to start into this and then sort of look at the real specific areas of expertise after that. Joanne, thanks for mentioning that culture gram uh, that I put together with the help of uh, Robert Hunt. Uh, he's uh, now on the faculty up at BYU Idaho. But he was just a young student at that point, and uh, we, as you say, David, we brought in all kinds of people. Yeah. And, and it's really wonderful when scholarship can interact with a wide range of people, and this whole book does that. It's, uh, we're not talking to people in the academy in some kind of arcane way. It's real life. And as I was walking in and out of the uh, Clyde building, uh, I went past a little office there where some people in the engineering department had started putting together culture grams. These were one-page explanations. If you were going to go to Kenya or New Zealand or wherever, and you wanted a quick rundown of what was going on 
in that country, the politics and the culture and holidays and things that uh, just ordinary good information. And I thought, why don't we have a culture, Graham, explaining to people what they would encounter if they went to Jerusalem 600 BC. So that's how that one got started. And, you know, we talk about everything about, so where do you stay? Is there, are there hotels? Actually, there weren't. It's a wonderful way to look at this world of the Book of Mormon with a family. Yeah. And it would be great as part of Come Follow Me at Home. Absolutely. So we want everyone to, to embrace this idea of actually being able to go and experience. And for the, the places where we can't be absolutely sure, your imagination doesn't have to wander very far from known material to put yourself into that uh, situation. And then we had a list of all the people that were players in this drama of the Book of Mormon in 600. Now, David, you called that chapter Dramatis Personae. Yeah, right. What does that mean? Well, it's the idea that we're going to enter like a play, and we're going to see the characters that were interacting with Lehi that we know from the Bible. Some are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Many aren't mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And oddly enough, we have lots of archaeological artifacts from some of these people now that we can talk about a little bit later. But then we had a photo essay here that showed us the kinds of uh, things that uh, would have, would that give us the illustrations of what life was like, not just the descriptions. We have a description of what the temple was like at the time of, of Lehi. We have what their home would have been like. We have what the wilderness was like. We have lots of pictures of the archaeology here that fills in the gaps of what we know from Jerusalem, because there's been lots of archaeology from this period. The Babylonians, when they destroyed Jerusalem, sort of froze lots of archaeology. I have two. From right at the period of Lehi. Yeah, now, Joanne, you, you put all the uh, <laughs> captions on these and brought these pictures together. Yeah. Tell us about that. I have two. Well, I just kind of had the idea, let's talk about... Um, when they left Jerusalem, what it was like for them, bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem. And it goes through, as David said, all these things, but I just wanted to point out two sort of favorite pictures. There's one right here that shows these seals, these rings that were used as seals that you would impress on clay and then you would wrap that around a document or something to show that it was an authentic document. And since we don't have pictures of the people from 600 BC, I like to look at this and think they represent people, all these different people, because there are seals of, you know, scribes, there are seals of merchants, there are seals of the king or even the prophet or whoever could have been there. Or bread bakers. Or bread bakers. They would put their seal on the loaf of bread. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't really a loaf, but. <laughs> so when I look at that, it, it, it brings in the common people because they might not be in the, you know, the list of the famous people that we have earlier, but that brings in the common people. And then there's one other picture I really love. It's this page right here. And in this page, the idea here is they found these pots. They're, they're not quite at 600. I think there might be 800, yes, but the same thing would typical. have been going on. It was typical. When, when Nephi and his brothers go back to get their money or their riches to take to Laban to borrow, uh, bargain for the plates, there was no bank. Where were they going? How did they go and get their their riches that they had left behind? And when I look at this picture, you see what they did. They would take their little pieces of silver because there weren't even coins at this time, 600 BC, but their pieces of silver or gold, they would put them in these ceramic pots and then bury these pots. So when they went up to their land of inheritance, in my mind I thought, oh yeah, they probably knew where the, their stuff was buried, and they could go and get that. And then you see down here, these are some of the contents of these pots. Mm -hmm. So that's how people would store their wealth or their riches, like it talks about the Book of Mormon. And those kind of pictures just bring the text to life. It really does. And it's not just 600 BC. Jesus is also familiar with the way clay pots were used to 
to collect your pieces of silver and yes. so on. And so what does he say? Lay not up in the earth your treasures, but lay up treasures in heaven. heaven. You do it on earth, it will rust and corrupt. So this was a very common widespread practice. And like you say, if you know where those are, the sons of Lehi can go and get those and make use of them, or at least try to. Yes. Now, I like this little picture too. There's one uh, of uh, Bedouin tents. And uh, I remember driving in a bus uh, with a whole bus load of people, that, family that were there over, over there with us. And we had a wonderful guide who, uh, whenever we wanted to talk about the Book of Mormon, he was listening and interested in that be because, of course, as an Israeli guide, he had never heard of Lehi before. But as we were down by Jericho, we were driving down, and he looked over on the side of the road, and there was a scene a lot like this. And he said, look, everybody, look. That's what Lehi's tent would have looked like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you can get that kind of experience. Now, these pictures, Joanne, that you're talking about uh, probably need to be updated a little bit. Yeah, there's and, probably some And we together. should put together a nice photo gallery uh, on the uh, Scripture Central website that would allow these to be more accessible. Uh, right now, uh, because of copyright clearances that we still need to get, these are not available on the Scripture Central version. But there is another uh, website called Scholars Archive uh, on the uh, BYU website. Right. And if you go there, you can find a PDF of the of the photo essay. It has these in them. So, so if you're wondering where is this, they're there. You just have to search a little more. Well, what else have we got here on the table of contents? Well, we worked hard to make sure that we provided an adequate historical background to the time. Uh, Joanne's already mentioned the discussion of Lehi's house in Jerusalem. Uh, we've mentioned the, the essay about a woman's world in Lehi's Jerusalem and the agriculture. Now talk about, for just a minute, Terry Ball and Bill Hess. Well, Terry Ball is unique in that he is trained in paleobotany, which he actually does study ancient plants. And, and Wilfred Hess also is accomplished as an expert on botany. And so these guy, these two scholars give us a view of agriculture, of what the day-to-day -day life would have been like, because the whole, the whole culture is based on agriculture and pastoralism, right? And Terry Ball got involved a lot with the uh, botany at the potential site of the land Bountiful. Right. And so he was brought into this for his expertise, but now talks about it a little more broadly. Uh, and uh, Bill Hess uh, will, uh, talk about in a later discussion of the allegory of the olive tree where he, he spent years working on the botany of ancient olives. So lots of good, interesting things that most of you out there uh, hadn't even thought to ask a question about, but interesting things. Well, because the Book of Mormon is a written record from the past, we have a nice collection here by Dana Pike of all the Israelite inscriptions from the time of Jeremiah and, and Lehi. Who's Dana Pike and how did he get involved here? Dana Pike is a Latter-day Saint scholar who worked in ancient scripture and is an expert on ancient inscriptions. And so he gives us a, a great review of the manner of writing and what inscriptions we do have from the ancient world from exactly this time period that shed light on the world of Lehi. And what would count as an inscription? Well, any kind of writing would really count as an inscription. When there's and what would they write on? Well, they wrote on stone, they wrote on pottery shirts, and they also wrote on skins. So unfortunately, most of the ancient texts have not survived on skins because most people don't realize this, Jerusalem is a very wet place and texts do not survive there. But we do have inscriptions from like Hezekiah's tunnel uh, written on stone there. We have collections of texts from a place called Arad that are written on uh, pottery shirts, right? So we do have, and, and most famously from the time of Lehi are the Lachish letters. 
a collection of pottery sherds that were letters written on pottery ostraca that were sent from Lachish at exactly the time of the Babylonian destruction. You mean they would take a piece of broken pot, clay pot, and they would write on it and send that as a letter? Why'd it's, they do that? And it survives forever, right? Pottery survives forever. And if you want to get rid of it, you try to burn it and it makes it last forever, forever, right? Well, it was readily available. Sometimes you go on these ancient tells and sites and they're just littered with pot sherds, and so it was a readily available piece of something to write a message on. But I wanted to add my favorite inscription that Dana Pike writes about is from the Ket Ketef Hinnom amulets that were found. Mm -hmm. And these are little tiny inscriptions about this big and about that wide. And on one of them, they have the earliest biblical inscription, and it comes right from this time period, 600 BC. It's the, uh, some verses or paraphrase of verses from the Book of Num Numbers. It's the Aaronic Benediction. It's a very beautiful poem. And the great thing about it is this little piece of scripture was written on silver plates. So it was engraved on metal just like the documents or the, the scriptures that Nephi and Lehi are bringing with them is engraved on the brass plates. So I find that really fascinating. Really fascinating. And it was then rolled up and worn as a necklace. Yeah, kind of like a good luck charm or something to remind you of the Lord. But it was found, wasn't it, in a tomb? Yes, just right outside the south side of Jerusalem. And it was on the body of a teenage girl. And so she was buried with this, the Aaronic Priesthood blessing. Yes. May the good Lord bless and keep Thank you. As her parents were mourning over the death of this daughter. And I think it's a very poignant uh, thing. And it's right from the time of Lehi. Yeah. Plus or minus a few decades. Yes. Can't be sure, but we can date these inscriptions because the writing changes a little bit from decade to decade, so it's... Uh, and also the level of the tomb and the, the pottery that's in the tomb, all of it dates right to that period. So it's really exciting. It is very exciting. And this was found, did Brother Nibley know about this in 1964? No, he didn't. What a, but he learned about it. Oh yeah, he learned about it as soon as it was he discovered, had, for sure. That's right. But these are new things that have come to light that help to uh, shed further light and good information about these texts. And when you talk about a version of an important blessing from Numbers chapter 6 being written and used and known by people generally that early, I thought that many people held that the book of Deuteronomy wasn't written until the Jews were in Babylon. David. What do you say about this amulet that was found with that Well, the amulet shows us that they already know the biblical text, and it's in pretty much the same form as the one we have in the Bible. And unfortunately, we've lost the scrolls from the time because they haven't survived, but they certainly do know these texts. That's a glimpse. That's a glimpse. Into yeah. Lehi's Jerusalem. Right. That tells us that uh, there were longer versions of that. And of course, one of the reasons it <clears throat> The uh, full text didn't survive just because Lehi took the brass plates with him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. That's right. But there they were. Well, there's more here. Uh, let's go. Uh, how about Lehi and Egyptian? Uh, John Thompson uh, gave us 20 years ago a summary of the connections between Lehi and Egypt. How would Lehi have known anything about Egypt? Right, and in the spirit of Nibley, this is an exploration of the Reformed Egyptian that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and the, and the exploration of what these relationships may, were like at the time of Lehi between Egypt and Judah. And we learn just like the Book of Mormon tells us, there were close relationships. And if Lehi was born, let's say, 650 BC, something like that, were there Egyptians in uh, Judea? Uh, that he would have encountered, especially 
in his land of inheritance. He's from the tribe of Manasseh. Right. So were there any Egyptians around Bet Shean in that area? Right, of course we learned that, well, we know from archeology span that, that Palestine, ancient Israel was a satellite of ancient Egypt. And ancient Egypt had bureaucratic and military fortresses all over the Holy Land at the time of, of earlier and even at the time of Lehi. So we do know that these connections existed. And he points out script and little pieces of Egyptian writing that have been found scattered in numerous places in the Syro-Palestine area. And he offers that, you know, that Lehi and Nephi could have learned to read this Egyptian from these inscriptions and possibly Egyptian was used as sort of a international accounting because lots of these are kind of accounting and merchant kinds of inscriptions. So that kind of adds a possibility there. Yeah. Excellent. So that's something people don't often think about. But if Lehi had become acquainted with and was a merchant, uh, having business connections with Egypt does make a lot of sense. Right. Well, we have some historical summary here uh, by Aaron Shade, the Kingdom of Judah, and he explores the international setting and what's going on in the history there. We have a wonderful piece by Jack Welch on the trial of Jeremiah. Uh, we have the discussion of Lehi and Jeremiah, the comparison of that and how the Book of Mormon fits with the title page of the Book of Mormon fits with the sacred history covenants and the Messiah uh, at the time of Lehi. Uh, calling of Lehi as a prophet. And then we have... Yeah, that, uh, <clears throat> that chapter looks at what are called throne theophanies. Uh, Prophets were called in certain ways in the ancient world, and one of them was seeing a vision of God seated upon his throne with the hosts of heaven around him and so on. There are some biblical accounts of other prophets. There are obscure accounts. <clears throat> but there in 1 Nephi chapter 1, we get the most explicit account of a throne theophany. And it's a foundational thing. It's, I call it Lehi's first vision. But it was just as important for Lehi uh, being called as a prophet as it was for Joseph Smith and his first vision. It was a life changer. And it fits, it fits the conventions of the call of a prophet known from the Bible, from the Old Testament, and also some other ancient cultures. I really love how the chapter that follows that, that does the religious background in the world of Lehi, it addresses those three concepts, the sacred history, the covenants, and the Messiah, and that mirrors exactly the three purposes of the Book of Mormon that we find on the title page. And so it gives you this wonderful background of the historical things that have happened to the covenant people that would be part of Lehi's tradition and helps them to remember, like we are trying to remember, the great things the Lord has done from us. And then it, it uh, reviews the covenants of Abraham and Moses which carry on through the whole Book of Mormon tradition down to the time of the Savior when he will bring the gospel to them. And finally, the coming of the Messiah and the promises of that, which mirrors that the purpose of the Book of Mormon to the convincing of everyone that Jesus is the Christ. It just, it, it brings this whole tradition that Lehi is gonna carry with him to the new world. And never was there a time when a redeemer, a Messiah, an anointed one was more needed than in that period. And some people sensed it, but obviously for political reasons, other people didn't. And David, one of the chapters that you focus on is this question, how could that great city be destroyed? Uh, what's the answer to that question? Well, I mean, we're kind of shocked by the fact that Lehi prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem and his sons, Laman and Lemuel, say, we do not believe the great city of Jerusalem can be destroyed. As we explore this in the Old Testament, we learn that the covenant of David was an unconditional covenant in the sense that there was a promise of the Messiah to come through his loins, the loins of David. But the people had misunderstood this covenant and they believed that they had an unconditional covenant of survival against the enemy. In the time of Hezekiah, when Israel was, or Judah was miraculously preserved from the Assyrian invasion, 
It gave them added confidence that they were invulnerable. And this essay explores the mindset of these people that believed that the Lord would protect them in spite of what they were doing. And of course, Jeremiah, he warns them in chapter 7, don't trust the temple, the temple, the temple, and don't trust that that's going to save you as long as you're breaking the covenant. It actually echoes what Laman and Lemuel say in Jeremiah when they're saying, you know, temple's here, Jerusalem will never be destroyed. And Laman and Lemuel just mirror this exact feeling. So we see that there, there's an interaction here with the Book of Mormon and the Old Testament that we know that's very closely related. And it's accurate in the Book of Mormon, this mindset that we have here. Well, there's an essay on the Rechabites. We have to bring that up because Nibley, of course, introduced this. And this is an opportunity for us to update that discussion uh, that Nibley had pointed out in his older writings. Yeah, the, the Rechabites, uh, <clears throat> Jeff Thompson and I put the, that chapter together <clears throat> because uh, of the narrative of Zosimus that uh, I've written about. Uh, according to this ancient narrative. And some of the earliest manuscripts say that the narrative of Zosimus was originally in Hebrew, but was then translated into Greek and eventually into Syriac. But it tells the story of a particular person named Zosimus who wants to know the way of the life of righteousness and is taken in a vision to a, a land across the ocean, or at least across a large body of water and there finds a group of people who had left Jerusalem at the same time Lehi had, and they were the followers of a person named Rachab. And he had lived for a time out in the wilderness. Anyway, the comparisons are very interesting. That Lehi is not the only one who is fleeing for his life here. And uh, many will be taken into uh, <clears throat> slavery to Babylon, but there are others that will scatter elsewhere. They'll flee and get out wherever they can when the, the destruction of the city comes. <clears throat> and speaking of that, one of the ways to go out was down through Arabia. I love this chapter, the final chapter in the book that Kent Brown writes. He, he takes sort of, after we've talked about Jerusalem and their life there, he takes us from Jerusalem down to the Red Sea and finally the coasts of Arabia, and he offers four different possible routes because of the geography there, the way Jerusalem is up on a hill and is surrounded by valleys, and then you have to go through these wadis, these canyons, down to the Red Sea and on, on down past the Dead Sea and to the Red Sea. There's really only four ways that would be a logical way for Lehi and his family to go. And you know, in our years living in Jerusalem, we've tried to drive down several of those and find out what it was like, and you realize how hard it was to take their family and their provisions through those areas. This was rough traveling for them. And then to get down to the Red Sea, this was a long ways away. And when they were called back to go and get the plates from Laban, that was a major effort. It took a very, very long time to get travel back up, the times that they had to do that. And so it's an interesting end to this book. It's taking them out of Jerusalem and finally on over to the possible sites of Bountiful and the seacoast where they're going to go to the Promised Land. Oh, Joanne, if you were there, do you think you would have murmured a little? Oh, yeah, I'm sure I would have. When Soraya murmurs, I, my heart goes out to her because she is living hard life there. And, and she has children, grown children who are unhappy and that's a, and they, they're living just together like in a camping situation. Anybody that goes camping with their, their family for more than a week knows things can get a little bit hairy and they're going to be together a long time as just that small group. So I really feel for her. And they don't even know how long it's going to be. They don't know where they're going. That is a massive faith step. Well, this uh, journey of faith going out into uh, the Arabian Peninsula, of course, they can't go to Egypt. Egypt. Egypt is not friendly. You can't go to Babylon. There's really nowhere to go. Uh, but Lehi knows how to travel 
Perhaps he had been a merchant and knew those roads. Maybe not, but at least he doesn't stay on the roads because he needs the Liahona to help him go. As Nibley pointed out, he wouldn't want to go on the main, the main uh, caravan routes because he doesn't want to be detected. But David, tell us a little bit here about this uh, Journey of Faith project that Kent Brown uh, takes this chapter and develops even further. Well, this is Joanne's territory because she's actually in this with DVD Jack. with Jack. Um, Ken Brown took sort of the idea of Lehi's Jerusalem and he expanded on it and made a DVD and a book. Maybe you can talk about it. Well, his DVD is probably the most wonderful thing to look at because it's going to give you visuals of lots of these places in Jerusalem that we've been talking about and a lot about the life of Lehi and Nephi and their family and Sariah. And then he will take us on this journey from Jerusalem down through the wilderness, down past the Dead Sea, through the coast to the shores of the Red Sea, and finally down the coast of the Arabian Peninsula to some possible sites of places that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And it's beautifully photographed. And this book right here, it's sort of a, a a book about the making of this documentary film, but there's gorgeous pictures in here, lots more color pictures that illustrate lots of the things that we have been talking about. So it's really a nice thing to go and look at. And in the spirit of glimpses, they have taken the scholars, that are experts on these topics, and they've integrated what they have to say about these on site. So it's sort of like glimpses brought to life a little bit. It really is. And this, this DVD you can watch on YouTube. It's easily yeah, you can just way. look up Journey of Faith. And the book's a little bit harder to come by. You can still get used copies, but uh, a marvelous extension of the spirit of Nibley through glimpses of Jerusalem made into a DVD. Lehi in the desert on steroids. Yes. On steroids, yeah. <laughs> well, David and Joanne, thank you for being with us. Uh, maybe a final question here might be, how well has this book survived? Uh, it's 20 years old now. Uh, are there lots of things here that uh, need to be fixed? Uh, are there additions that might be made? What, uh, what's your assessment of what we did 20 years ago? I think it's held up pretty well. And like all things that we do, like what Nibley was doing, new information continues, especially through archaeology in the Holy Land. And Joanne can tell us about two exciting seals that have been found, not exactly from the time of Lehi, but this is the spirit of the kinds of things that change our understanding uh, of Jerusalem. Well, they've done lots of archaeology in Jerusalem, particularly on that south side of the Temple Mount and um, on the hills where Lehi may have lived. And the reason I love these two seals, you know, we talked about the pictures of the people earlier, they discovered in uh, actually about 2009 a cache of about 33 bulla or bulli, which are the impressions that the seals make. And one of those seals was announced in 2015, which is of King Hezekiah, which was just fascinating. He's a little bit before Lehi. He, he reigned between about 715 to 687 BC, but he's you know, a predecessor with his reforms to what's going to happen in Lehi's lifetime with Josiah's reforms. But this seal of Hezekiah, it was found on this, this Oph, in the Ophel digs, you know, right on that south side of the Temple Mount. And um, it has his name belonging to Hezekiah. Then there's a little bit missing, probably said son of Ahaz, king of Judah. And on it, there's an image of a winged sun disk with two onks on each side, which to me is interesting because it brings in that Egyptian connection. It's in their art. It's in their seals. It's sort of pervasive in the land at the time before Lehi and continuing on in his time. And the onk symbolized eternal life. Yeah, eternal life. Which so. the king obviously would see as a, a yeah. very powerful and uh, appropriate symbol for the power that he represents. Exactly. And the, and the chapters from, from Isaiah in the Book of Mormon are from this period, and Ahaz is part of the story. Yes. 
And then, you know, it takes a while to go through 33 different seals. The experts and epigraphers have to look at the language and the letters to determine what it says and, you know, who they belong to. In 2018, there was an announcement of another seal impression or bulla that has these words, Isaiah, prophet. But there's a little bit of controversy over this one. Um, these seals, the, the Hezekiah one, let's go back there for just a minute. There were other Hezekiah seals, impressions that had been found earlier, but they weren't found in an official dig. So their provenance was a little questionable. So when these were, this Hezekiah one was announced in 2015, it was from an official dig with an official archeologist from the university, Alot Mazar, and they knew exactly where it came from, exactly what level and time period, everything was official. The second one, the Isaiah prophet seal um, impression announced in 2018, came from exactly the same place, the same level, but it has a little more damage. So uh, it, the word prophet, which is uh, the proposed reading of the archeologist and the specialist, is missing the last letter. So we don't know for sure if that's what it said, but it was found just a few feet away from Hezekiah's seal impression. Same level, same time period, and they are contemporaries, we know that. And I think that her suggestion that it read Isaiah the prophet is probably spot on. There are other experts who support this reading and the um, provenance of this and think that probably this was his. And it's wonderful because you have these two people now that were living there, were part of these reforms and the prophetic tradition, and I, f I just find that really exciting. And in 2019, another seal impression was found of Nathan Melech, servant of the king, who is mentioned in Second Kings as one of the servants of Hezekiah. So there is a whole bunch of these people. And the thing that this tells me is lots of times you hear things from scholars that say there's no evidence, there's no evidence. And what I've learned, it may take a few years or even decades, but little by little, little pieces are found that fill in some of the blanks and offer us, you know, pieces of uh, personal property of the people who live there and their names that we can connect back to the biblical story and sometimes even the Book of Mormon story. One other really fun piece of archaeology that's come about in 2016. There's a city that's south of Jerusalem called Lachish. And this is famous from the Lachish letters that are from this same time period. They were excavating at the big city gates and they discovered a gate shrine. And what this was is sometimes, you know, things would go a little bit off track and you would have these, we would call them an apostate gate shrine where there would be an altar to, you know, one of the Canaanite gods or something. And they found one of these in this uh, city gate at Lachish in 2016. And when they were excavating, they found evidence of these reforms that were taking place by people like Hezekiah or Josiah. And they found this little horned altar where the horns had been chipped off, which is what they did when they were trying to decommission these gate shrines that were off track. And they also found a latrine or a toilet seat. And this was like, no one could believe this, but it actually follows exactly a passage in the Book of Kings that when they're trying to, you know, take out these apostate shrines, it said, they demolished the pillar of Baal and destroyed the temple of Baal and made it a latrine to this day, which means they would take something like a toilet and put it where the gate shrine was so it was completely decommissioned, desacralized. The people would know this is not the right place to go. And they had never seen this before, the archaeologists, until 2016 they found it. And so it shows us that these reforms during the time of Hezekiah or later during Josiah and Lehi's lifetime, things that they would do to kind of combat 
these these part these apostate ideas that were infiltrating the Israelites lifetime so there's exciting things all the time just this last August they found another ash layer in the Mount Zion area just outside of Jerusalem from the Babylonian destruction that Lehi prophesied about so little by little it takes a lot of patience but they find things that are, are really interesting and exciting from this Biblical and Book of Mormon record. Absolutely. Well, it sounds, Joanne, like what we need is a supplement of <laughs> some yeah. kind. Maybe, but, but not a revision. I think, David, you're right. This book has weathered very well. Yeah, I think so. And we do now have added material, but I don't know of anything that I would say is wrong, that needs to be corrected. So people, don't say it's 20 years old and I don't need to read this. I think this is a great place to start for anyone who would like to get a sense of what it was like to live in Lehi's world. Right, and as Elder Holland said, remember, the Book of Mormon began in Jerusalem. Well, thank you, David and Joanne, for explaining all of this. I can see that students for the last 30 years in the Jerusalem Center have been wonderfully blessed by your teaching. Well, we've been blessed by being with the students too. And I imagine you can hardly go anywhere without somebody coming up and saying, thank you for what you taught us <clears throat> there in the Jerusalem Center, it's, it's wonderful. And there are messages to each one of us. You don't have to go to Jerusalem to experience this sort of thing. I mean, just what Joanne was talking about, about these seals that were used when someone wanted to be sure that it was clear that a pot or a document or something belonged to them, they would use these seals to put an impression on it. King Benjamin ends his speech by saying that you must do these things so that God can seal you his, exactly. which is marking you in a way saying, I want people to know that you belong to me, God is saying. And we do sealings in the temple in much the same way that the sealing of the power of the covenant of the priesthood and of the blessings, and not just upon an individual, but upon a couple or a family, those then are marked as belonging to the Lord. So these are lessons that come into our own lives personally. And there's so many things like that in the scriptures. We're not just talking about ancient history. The world of Lehi, as if uh, that's irrelevant to our modern, sophisticated world. Uh, I love working with these ancient materials because of what they tell me about eternal life, about culture, about endurable values, about the truths of the gospel that are lasting, that we might have everlasting life. And that's why the Book of Mormon has been brought forth, that we may know of the covenants and the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these details help us to put skin on the bones so that you might say we can have skin in the game. Yep. Just bring it's it real. to life. Bring yeah. it to life. Yes. These dry bones these dry artifacts uh, will live, just as the blessings of Israel will be brought back, as Ezekiel 37 has to say. Yes. Well, thank you all, and uh, I hope you find these things if you have any questions or problems. Uh, you know how to reach Scripture Central, and we'll be happy to help. So, Lord bless you all. Thanks very, very much.